As I mentioned, Laura Dupuy is the Executive Director of the Utah Council for Citizen Diplomacy. With 56% of Americans believing we should leave Afghanistan now, what do we stand to lose if we depart prematurely from this increasingly dangerous and unpredictable region? What is the significance of the May 1, 2012 Strategic Partnership Agreement pledging U.S. support in Afghanistan through 2024? And most importantly, why should you care? Lara Dupuy, Executive Director of the Utah Council for Citizen Diplomacy, spent time in Afghanistan earlier this year. Along with five other community leaders, she traveled to Afghanistan at the invitation of Ambassador Ryan Crocker and the U.S. Department of State. The delegation was invited to evaluate the situation for themselves and were provided access to representatives from throughout Afghanistan, including meetings with President Hamid Karzai, General John Allen, ISAF Commander, and the Ministers of Health, Finance, Education, Agriculture, and Mining. Lara Dupuy also met with many women whose lives have been shaped by the past two decades and who were fearful of their future as NATO forces withdraw in 2014. She will share her journey through photos and firsthand accounts of her meetings with nearly 100 Afghans. As I mentioned, Laura is the, is the executive director of the Utah Council for Citizen Diplomacy, one of the most exciting organizations here in Utah because this is an organization that helps citizens make personal connections with other citizens from around the world. If you uh, grew up outside of Utah, you may have heard of World Affairs Councils. You may be familiar with the work they do. Well, UCCD is the World Affairs Council of Utah. They bring uh, over a 1,000 um, international visitors working very closely with their State Department partners to Utah. And so on any given week, you will hear of firefighters or university presidents or mayors or business leaders who are uh, usually, I guess, in homestays uh, all across uh, Salt Lake and, and Utah, experiencing the United States, experiencing Utah, and getting to know uh, this beautiful landscape and the wonderful people that we have here. Um, that's the essence of citizen diplomacy. Uh, if, if you Google Lara Dupuy, which you might want to do, you'll find uh, a number of interviews. I, I came across a very interesting interview that the State Department has put up. Uh, Laura is, is something of, of an expert and a national um, spokesperson for the, the notion that citizen diplomacy can make a difference in international affairs. This is a really important idea to us at the Kennedy Center, and I think something that you'll find both inspiring and helpful as you think about how you can make a difference in the world. Please join me in welcoming Laura Dupuy. Thank you, Corey, for that very warm welcome. It's such an honor to be here. I'm always inspired when I drive through the gates at BYU and I see the sign that says, the world is our campus, go forth and serve. We're all citizen diplomats, whether intentionally or unintentionally, whether we meet a visitor on the street who's uh, looking at a map trying to figure out their way around our beautiful cities, or whether we're studying abroad in Spain, or if um, just happenstance leads us abroad in our careers, we all represent our country. We all represent our families and our communities. We call citizen diplomacy the idea that as citizens, we have the right and even the responsibility to help shape U.S. foreign relations one handshake at a time. And I'm very excited about the work that uh, the Kennedy Center has done and the forthcoming book um, on citizen diplomacy because I know each of you here with the work that you do and the brilliant careers you have ahead of you are indeed citizen diplomats and I look forward to learning from you. Um, I'm gonna make a disclaimer to start. I'm not an expert about Afghanistan. I have no degrees. I am simply a citizen diplomat who had the extraordinary opportunity to get a phone call inviting me to come to Afghanistan as a member of a World Affairs Council delegation. So before we start, have we got anyone here in our audience who has been to Afghanistan or who is an expert? No? One, oh, a couple. All right, well, thank you so much for being here. Please correct me or add to, to what I have to say. Uh, it, it is a very complicated and very fascinating uh, place in the world. I'm going to um, begin. Next time you go out to lunch, I saw there are a few Chinese restaurants around, and you might get a fortune cookie. 
take it very seriously. <laughs> because I got one in February, and it said, you will soon travel to an exotic place to learn more about yourself. Well, a week later, I got a phone call that said, would you like to come to Afghanistan is a guest of the U.S. Department of State and Ambassador Ryan Crocker. And I said, of course. How could I not? Um, I had about a week to prepare. I knew very little about Afghanistan, except for the fact that my parents had traveled there in September of 1978. They said it was a fascinating place, and they were very struck by the number of Russians who they saw in the country. And we, uh, most of us know kind of where, where that led. There we go. Um, while I was there, and Corey mentioned this a bit, I had the opportunity to meet with leaders, um, ordinary citizens, public and private sector uh, representatives to help learn more, to have open conversations and dialogues about what are the issues that Afghans are facing, both at the governmental level and at the personal level. And although our visit was sponsored by the U.S. Embassy, all of our conversations were completely open and free. They were conducted outside the prism of any media or official reports. A lot of people ask me, well, how do you get to Afghanistan? <laughs> well, first of all, you go to the Salt Lake International Airport and jump on that uh, lovely direct flight to Paris. From Paris to Dubai, how many of you have been the, in the Dubai airport? Quite a few. It is one of the most amazing places in the world. I saw more people from more countries uh, than I had ever imagined in my life. And then I had the opportunity to travel on Safi Airlines, um, the Afghan Airlines. There are two planes in the fleet. Um, one is a little newer in, than the other, so we were happy that we were on the newer flight. Um, the departure lounge was a little quiet. But after a flight uh, coming in, uh, flying over the beautiful mountains that reminded me a lot of Salt Lake, uh, it, uh, just as the sun was coming over the mountains, we landed at the uh, Kabul airport. This, you might uh, suspect, is an old picture that I got off the internet. Photos weren't allowed, um, but I'll tell you, the airport looks just like this. So things have not changed very much in, uh, since the airport was built. When I walked into the departure lounge and the arrival lounge, I knew I had traveled to a part of the world that I had never imagined I would have the benefit of visiting. And just to give you a context, when I was 16 years old, I was, I think I was one of the luckiest people in the world. My dad came home from work, this was 1969, and he said, pack your bags, we're moving to South Korea. So I learned what it meant to be a citizen diplomat when I was 16 and graduated from high school in Seoul. I just didn't have a name for it until I became the director of the Utah Council for Citizen Diplomacy. But it shaped my worldview, and um, I could not believe, truly, that I was now in Afghanistan. We were swiftly escorted uh, the couple of miles from the airport to our U.S. Embassy in Kabul. This was going to be my home for a week. Now, I don't know about you, but I always had a dream. This was an unfulfilled dream of joining the Foreign Service or working for our um, great United States in some capacity. Do we have anyone in the audience who is thinking perhaps a career in Foreign Service or USAID? There are a lot of you. Oh, so um, I can't uh, support your choice more highly. This was my one week to get to pretend like I was in the Foreign Service because I was going to be living on our embassy compound. 
this is what our, uh, the guest quarters at the embassy look like. I don't have a lot of pictures. Um, I want this to be as much of a travel log as possible, but um, there really weren't. There are security issues, as you can well imagine, but uh, this actually was posted on the internet, so I borrowed it since it was uh, sort of in free space. Uh, but this is what the hooch looks like, and this is where we were going to stay. And these are not only the guest quarters, but these are also where our long, our um, junior uh, foreign service officers live. This is called a two-man sleeper. It's uh, a, a little bit like a, uh, uh, a shipping crate. But come on in. This is what it looked like. Um, <laughs> it, it was very small. It had a bathroom. I had on this side two bunk beds. So this space is actually designed for two people. So if you if you go to a, a post of this nature, uh, you might find yourself living with a roommate in um, in, a, in a hooch, uh, but you've got television. So that's uh, that can occupy some time. On the back of the door, if you're staying in a hotel, it usually says checkout times noon. Well, checkout time uh, potentially uh, in this environment uh, had a little uh, more dangerous ramifications. It says, in case of rocket attack, immediately seek cover. If you're in your hooch, get under your bed. And this is a real reality. Um, a week after I left, uh, there was a uh, major attack, uh, the Haqqani Network, uh, uh, fired into our embassy. They fired into other areas of the NATO uh, forces um, areas. And uh, fortunately, there were not uh, uh, significant casualties, uh, but just damage. So this is something that our, our embassy staff uh, live with. While we were there, this uh, new section on the right, uh, the, the lighter color, of our embassy was just being constructed. Uh, this is going to be our world's largest uh, embassy, the one in Kabul. Uh, it is has hundreds of personnel and is the home to five ambassadors. This was one of the uh, the images that I was able to take. A, a guy with his AK-47 headed off to work in his suit. Um, but security was a huge issue. And we were told we were not allowed to go into the streets, into the uh, markets. And I'll tell you a little bit about what our day looked like while we were on the embassy. We were the guest of Ambassador Ryan Crocker. Uh, Ambassador Crocker is one of our country's most distinguished and decorated ambassadors. He is an Arabic speaker and has um, extensive experience throughout the Middle East and served as our U.S. ambassador when the U.S. went to Iraq. He has served uh, twice in Afghanistan. He retired once, and Ambassador er, President Obama asked him to please come back to assist with the, um, the transition in Afghanistan and he graciously did so. He believes that the news coming from Afghanistan is not very good, and s there are good things that need to be reported. One of the purposes of his uh, sponsoring our visit was to help us see what some of the successes are so that we can share those with our community. This is a photo of the delegation with Ambassador Crocker in the middle. There were six of us. I was the only one from the western United States, and the others were from the east uh, and south. The mission of the embassy in Kabul is very clear. It is to prevent the return of ta the Taliban and al-Qaeda. It is to help the Afghan people create a credible and sustainable state. It's to help Afghanistan be seen as transparent and fair and it's to send signals to our allies and adversaries that the U.S. won't repeat what Russia did um, and, to, and which led to paving the way to 9-11. They are dedicated to helping the Afghan people transfer security to the Afghan National Forces by 2014 and to forge a long-term strategic partnership 
through 2024. Oops, wrong one, there we go. Um, if you join the Foreign Service, you might start out as a public affairs officer, and we were honored to have uh, the assistance of Antoinette Hurtado. She's been with the uh, embassy uh, here in Kabul for three years. She had been in Brazil prior to that, a graduate of Georgetown with a uh, master's degree from Harvard University. Uh, she was our go-to person throughout the event. Uh, after her tour here in Kabul, she has just left for a three-year assignment at the Holy See. But as I worked with uh, Antoinette and all of our embassy staff, I was so impressed by the dedication, the intelligence, and the courage of all of our um, embassy. When I got home, I realized I needed to learn a little bit more about Afghanistan and some of the forces that shaped it. And so here is just a very quick run through, just to remind you, as this landlocked nation, it has been the center of tremendous uh, turmoil, tremendous uh, quests for conquest, uh, starting with Alexander the Great um, in 300 BC. Islam was introduced to Afghanistan um, in 600 AD. And Buddhism was an important part of Afghan culture. And we, uh, mo many of us are familiar with the Buddhas of Bamiyan. Genghis Khan invades in 1219. And Tamerlane Empire extended for 300 years across the region. Um, a, a huge uh, dynast dynastic um, empire. The the individual who's considered the father of modern Afghanistan is Ahmad Shah Durrani. Uh, Durrani is a Pashtun. Uh, the Durrani clan continues to be one of the most important ethnic groups in Afghanistan. And indeed, Ahmad Karzai is a member of the Durrani uh, group. And in the 1800s, um, Afghanistan became the center of a conflict that between Britain and Russia, which was called the Great Game. They believed that whoever controlled Afghanistan controlled the heartland of Central Asia and consequently the heartland of the world. Um, Afghanistan was ruled by Britain on a couple of occasions. Uh, and it's very interesting as we look at the news that's coming out with the impending withdrawal of our NATO forces, that the term, the great game, is being used once again. Who is going to be in control of Afghanistan? Will it be Afghanistan, or will it be someone else? King Amanullah was a significant figure in uh, modern Afghan history. He was a very worldly individual who traveled, who looked at his country and said, we must enter the modern age. And indeed, he made tremendous forces. His queen, Soraya, uh, was instrumental. She stood by his side. Uh, she was part and parcel of helping women uh, gain uh, freedom, of gaining rights. And the uh, traditional veil was abolished during this period of time. I was really amazed in, uh, as I looked around for pictures of what Afghanistan looked like in the 1950s. And this is a picture uh, in Kabul. This is, these are some girls shopping at a record store. Um, it was a very modern, uh, very cosmopolitan, very beautiful city, Kabul. Women worked outside the home. <laughs> they studied together, girls and boys. They went to uh, university. And I love this picture because I had that same hairdo in my yearbook in Seoul Foreign School in 1969. So indeed, um, Afghanistan was a part of the world. And this is what it looked like in 1977. And I have to say that as we did drive through the streets of Kabul, it still looks almost exactly like this. There was a, a, a whole series of uh, other rulers, and I won't go into a lot of the, the details of the history, but it's really quite fascinating. 
But Afghanistan was declared a republic in 1973. But the Communist Party arrived virtually by invitation of the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan. And in 1978, uh, December, just uh, three months after my parents had uh, spent a month touring through Afghanistan, uh, the Soviets invaded, which gave rise to uh, the Mujahideen. The US helped to arm the resistance. I'm sure, how many of you have seen Charlie Wilson's War? Yeah, if you haven't seen it I, and you're interested in Afghanistan, please that's, check it out. It's a really um, interesting perspective. One of the images that uh, has stuck with many in my generation is this picture from the National Geographic, 1985, the girl with the green eyes. Um, this was one of the world's largest um, diasporas where uh, millions of Afghans resettled in Pakistan uh, through this period. But the Geneva Accords ensured full Soviet withdrawal in February of 1989. But 1996 saw the rise of the Taliban. And most significantly, I think for a lot of us, uh, particularly one of the things that came, I came home with was what this new world order for women looked like. <clears throat> and I'm sorry for this, but it needs, we need to be reminded that um, it is a dangerous time and as we look forward to what the future might hold, should the Taliban come back, we're not uncertain what it might look like for women. Um, <clears throat> one of our greatest allies during this period was um, the Lion of Panjshir, Masood. He was the great uh, leader of the Northern Alliance and one of the great hopes for Afghanistan's leadership. A, ver a moderate, a poet, a great thoughtful individual who was assassinated two days before 9-11. Al-Qaeda recognized that he was their greatest threat. But the Taliban did decide to provide sanctuary to Osama bin Laden, and the US and allied forces entered Afghanistan with Operation Enduring Freedom. In October 9th, 04, Hamid Karzai was elected president of the eight million that voted, 41% were women. Uh, Corey mentioned our program, and the Utah Council for Citizen Diplomacy works as a private sector partner with the U.S. Department of State's International Visitor Leadership Program. It's the sister program to Fulbright Scholarships. We invite emerging leaders to come to the U.S. as guests of our government for short-term professional programs. Ahmed Karzai was invited to come to the U.S. and uh, I believe it was 1998 as a guest and participated in this program. And um, he is one of 55 acting heads of state who are alumni of our program. But this is what Kabul looked like to me. And this, these, some of these photos were taken outside the, or, or through the window of the armored SUV. We were not allowed to leave the embassy compound um, without the security of being in an armored vehicle. It is simply too dangerous. Uh, we saw a few uh, aid workers, uh, humanitarian um, uh, workers uh, out and about, but it is a very dangerous situation for uh, Westerners. Uh, but we saw street vendors, and we saw a vibrant city. It, um, but the thing that I, I lo loved about Kabul, and I had heard this from a lot of our Afghani visitors, when they come to Salt Lake, they go, oh, we feel so at home. And it's simple to see why. It's a city that's ringed with mountains, and it could be mistaken for Salt Lake, although Kabul is about... 1,200 feet higher in elevation than Salt Lake, and we could feel it. The climate was about the same. One of the great treats that we had was to visit the Babur Gardens. The Aga Khan Foundation has restored them to uh, their, uh, their splendor. They are the only green space in Kabul. Afghanistan's considered the dustiest country in the world, and you truly believe it. Um, 
and particularly when you see from this perspective from TV Hill. Certainly, the burqa remains, and it's a, it's a way for women to have security. It's a way for uh, uh, traditionalists to, to continue to keep women in this traditional world. The week, two weeks, actually, before I left on my trip, uh, I had the pleasure of welcoming a group delegation from the Department of State. Uh, who had been selected is the International Women of Courage winners. They came from 10 different countries. And on the l left of Michelle Obama is um, Mariam Durrani of Afghanistan. And I was so pleased. The following uh, two weeks later, I got to meet Mariam once again at the embassy reception honoring her accomplishments. She is the owner and operator of a women's issues radio station in Kandahar. She leaves her home to go to work dressed in one set of clothes. She changes clothes to come home. She changes her roots every day. She is a target for assassination. People don't want her to have a voice. But yet, courageously, she survived six assassination attempts. She's 28 years old. She is indeed a woman of courage. We had the opportunity to sit down with the Minister of Public Health, Soraya Dal, 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 Dal. <laughs> I apologize to her for not pronouncing her name correctly. And she was an extraordinary woman. She sat at the head of the uh, a huge conference table and proudly said, 10 years ago, I would not have been allowed to walk into this building. 10 years ago, if I had been allowed to walk out on the street, I would have been in a burqa. 10 years ago, I would have had to have been accompanied by my husband or an appropriate male. Today, I sit here as the head of the Ministry of Health. She um, studied in Pakistan uh, during the Soviet occupation and received her master's in public administration uh, public health uh, from Harvard. But these were some of the societal changes. Um, in the last 10 years, just 10 years, and I think this is extraordinary, life expectancy for an average Afghan has gone from 44 to 62. Much of that has to do with maternal care for women. There has been an increase in the number of midwives from 400 to 3,000. Access has jumped from 9% to 64. And for those of us who, um, who know how challenged um, we are with uh, some of our health care issues today, the definition of medical care is that they can find someone who can administer some kind of aid within a day's walk of their home. But infant deaths have dropped by 22%. Nevertheless, one in four infants die before the age of five. So education is one of the greatest challenges that they're facing. And in 78, the teacher ratio was 35 to 1. But today, it's 27 to 1. Uh, during the Taliban, only 12,000 uh, children attended school, uh, and now over three million are attending school, and about half of those are girls. And Afghan students continue to attend the madrasas in Pakistan. Three million girls now in school. The goal for education is that by 2020, all children in Afghanistan will be able to complete primary education. They're going to add 50,000 new teachers. And they have a really interesting strategy. They want to build madrasas within Afghanistan so that they can uh, create a formal curriculum so that students won't go to Pakistan for the more radicalized studies, but that it will be a balanced study with 40% general studies, 40% Islamic studies, 10% computer skills, and 10% language studies, meaning English or French or other languages. We met with the Minister of Education, um, uh, Mr. Wardock, and I loved this quote. He says, once you start teaching girls, they turn into atom bombs. You can't stop them. 
Um, contrast your uh, arrival at your, your university today with what it would look like if you attended the American University of Afghanistan. This is an English curriculum program that's uh, created on the model of the American University of Beirut, or Cairo. Um, there are currently 800 full-time students and 800 part-time students. It is a uh, real honor to be accepted to the program. Uh, they are focusing on business, entrepreneurship, uh, nursing, and, uh, and a handful of uh, very uh, much needed occupations. When I walked into the university, I saw this sign. Do you want a full, bra full scholarship to America through Fulbright? I went, oh, yay, I hope, I hope people will come. It was interesting. I didn't notice until after I got home that someone had written no on that. So despite the fact that, um, that there's uh, a lot of um, acceptance of American support, uh, there are, of course, the opposition. Economic gains. People's incomes have gone up. It is still the poorest country in the world. There is an American Afghan Chamber of Commerce, and we met rep with representatives, and it was really quite fascinating. One of my favorite uh, encounters was with Hisana Sayad. Uh, she is an entrepreneur, uh, a multimillionaire who has started out by uh, giving women the opportunity to do textiles. She's branched into agriculture, into heavy uh, equipment and machinery. Uh, she is a great inspiration for women all, um, all throughout Afghanistan. One of the things that I found very interesting is I found a picture of her at home with her two children. They were playing on the swing in the backyard, but very uh, quietly in the background, you saw two different armed guards. So uh, despite her success, her, um, she is threatened. Agriculture represents about 50% of the economy, and we all know about the poppy, and 90% of the world's heroines coming from Afghanistan. But there's significant uh, efforts to create crop substitution from poppies to pomegranates to apricots to almonds. Uh, they're working really diligently to create agricultural trade programs with India, and they've had some very successful food trade fairs uh, where all of the Afghan vendors have sold out. Uh, transportation continues to be a problem. Uh, there are there are limited access for roads, for transporting the produce, uh, but there is some progress in this area. The Minister of Mines, um, Mr. Sharani, uh, was one of the most impressive that we met because the mineral deposits in Afghanistan are considerable. Uh, coal, talc, um, oil, there's precious stones, there's gold. Um, indeed, almost 50% of the country's GDP can come from mining. But the problem is, is that the security issues are so tremendous that it discourages outside investors to, um, to make that commitment to the mining. Um, the world's, uh, one of the world's largest copper mines is there. Uh, but again, uh, what we're seeing or what they, we were told is that the Chinese are the groups that are uh, having the, um, uh, cre creating those business opportunities. We had a meeting with this gentleman, Abdul Sayef. This was, he is a warlord. Um, he is now an elected member of parliament. Uh, he is a member of the Taliban. But there is an effort to legitimize the Taliban as a uh, political party and create some level of moderacy. Um, he's a really bad guy, though. I did a lot of research, and um, and he uh, the the meeting itself was very interesting because we went to his home, which was a heavily fortified uh, with uh, uh, probably uh, ten armed. Uh, uh, security guards for each one of us, um, but his position is we want um, the Americans to stay. Sorry, this one was out of order, but uh, the gemstones, the mining potential is tremendous. But one of the biggest concerns, again, is the absence of the 
Afghan woman's voice in the discussions and the decisions about peace. And no negotiation or decision can be complete if half of a world, half of a country's population's views are ignored. And of all of the people that we met, the women really, uh, their stories were the most uh, impactful and they have the most to lose when the uh, NATO forces withdraw. Uh, one of the most exciting meetings was at ISAF headquarters when we met with General John Allen. Uh, he is an inspiring leader and if I, I just have to say that he gave us a, a full hour briefing um, the day after he returned from uh, giving testimony to Congress. And I must say that he is a genuinely heartfelt man who truly wants to see Afghanistan succeed, to have security in that country. And we uh, were very lucky to have General Allen. But the terrorism continues to be the biggest uh, security threat. This is what we were told from our, um, our sources at the embassy. Ambassador Crocker says, it's not a matter of when the next 9-11 will be, but where, and then what will it cost? So Al-Qaeda, the Haqqani Network, and other extremist groups are continuing to operate. Um, we had a visit to the presidential palace. I sat in a chair right at the end of that sofa on the left. And <laughs> I don't have the photo to, to show, but uh, uh, President Karzai was extremely cordial, very gracious. He continued to reiterate that he wishes to work with the Americans, that he wishes for a peaceful transition. But indeed, 2014 is a perfect storm for a country at a tipping point. With the drawdown of our security forces, in addition, the presidential elections, there's no clear area about which direction the Afghan people will go. Um, but with that said, Afghan civil society needs to have a secure and stable environment. On May 1st, um, President Obama and President Karzai signed their Memorandum of Understanding, their Enduring Strategic Partnership, which affirmed the cooperation and that we will continue to support Afghan um, interests through 2024. But why should we care? These are some questions that I, I turn over in my mind. I don't have an answer, and I hope that y'all will just simply think about some of these things. The cost of the war since um, 2001, which by the way, uh, the war in Afghanistan is the lar longest lasting war that the United States has been in. Um, we've spent $538 billion. We've lost nearly 2,000 troops. And then a question that arises, are we supporting a corrupt and ungrateful regime? That was a question that uh, came up as we as we talked. But it's not just about Al-Qaeda because the Taliban not only has the opportunity to destabilize Afghanistan, but it has the opportunity to destabilize Pakistan. Um, Pakistan, Afghanistan continue to be crucial um, as we look at this entire geopolitical region. And then there continues to be the, the threat from the, the drug lords. But we also learned that there is a potential for a huge humanitarian crisis. And we were so told time and again, please do not abandon us. Now, on the other side of the fence, half of the population would love to see us leave. And those are the ones who would like to, to seize control and um, in turn power back to the Taliban. I saw this article and it was really, or this uh, Doonesbury, I don't know if you can r read it, but it uh, says, goodbye sandbox, uh, uh, see you later, no you won't, I won't, um, oh yes, I'll come back and see the real Afghanistan, stay in a sweet little hotel, uh, a nice little inn, and then the one on the end says, girl, do you ever watch the news? In other words, that's not happening. 
But I get a Google alert. So here's one of the things about citizen diplomacy. When we travel abroad, it opens our minds, and we want to learn more. So I get a Google alert every day. There are about 20 to 30 hits that I get. And here were just a couple of the headlines that I thought I would uh, share. So Afghanistan, the who cares world, war from the Wall Street Journal. I don't know if you saw about the, uh, the party goers by, that were killed by the insurgents. And then we have a report, US soldiers get sensitivity training in Afghanistan. So we get all these mixed messages. Um, another one, why isn't Afghanistan a campaign issue? Battle rages in Afghanistan, but political and public focus fades. Triple suicide bombs kill 20 people. And have we forgotten Afghanistan? What happens to Afghanistan? What about corruption? Corruption and transparency are huge issues um, that make it difficult for foreign investors to come in. And then the last one, the first NATO trucks roll into Afghanistan after months of negotiation. Um, supply trucks, humanitarian aid, uh, building equipment, uh, everything has been stalled at the border from Pakistan for uh, years, and, and these, these are really difficult situations. But I did find this one that I just wanted to, to add at the end, Afghan news that will make you happy. <laughs> Good Afghan news. And uh, here was a story about an exciting day for uh, the Afghan basketball team. And another says that more Afghans now have access to electricity. So uh, there are two books that I came back and, and read subsequent to my visit, and I highly recommend them. Uh, one is called Killing the Cranes by Edward Jourdain, and the other has just been uh, published, and this is called Little America, The War Within the War for Afghanistan. Um, this is by Rajiv Ch Chandraskara, who wrote um, Imperial Life in the Emerald City about Iraq, which is also another really good read. Um, but I wanted to end with a happy face um, because the future of Afghanistan are the wonderful people, the beautiful children, the wonderful sense of hospitality, the, th the thirst for knowledge uh, that all of the Afghan people have. Um, but it's been a pleasure to, to share some of my vision and some of the things that I learned. And I think we might have just time for one or two questions or, or feedback uh, from those who've been there. <laughs>